As the first book to read this year, I chose The Kite Runner, a powerful but heartbreaking story about friendship that follows one man's journey to confront his past and find redemption. Let's read it together. Chapter 1, December 2009 I became what I am today at the age of 12, on a frigid overcast day in the winter of 1975. I remember the precise moment, crouching behind a crumbling mud wall, peeking into the alley near the frozen creek. That was a long time ago, but it's wrong what they say about the past, I've learned, about how you can bury it, because the past claws its way out. Looking back now, I realize I have been peeking into the deserted alley for the last 26 years. One day last summer, my friend Rahim Khan called from Pakistan. He asked me to come see him. Standing in the kitchen with the receiver to my ear, I knew it wasn't just Rahim Khan on the line. It was my past of unatoned sins. After I hung up, I went for a walk along Spreckles Lake on the northern edge of Golden Gate Park. The early afternoon sun sparkled on the water where dozens of miniature boats sailed, preppled by a crisp breeze. Then I glanced up and saw a pair of kites, red with long blue tails, soaring in the sky. They danced high above the trees on the west end of the park over the windmills floating side by side like a pair of eyes looking down on San Francisco, the city I now call home. And suddenly, Hassan's voice whispered in my head, For you, a thousand times over. Hassan, the hair-lipped kite runner. I sat on the park bench near a willow tree. I thought about something Rahim Khan said before he hung up, almost as an afterthought. There is a way to be good again. I looked up at those twin kites. I thought about Hassan, thought about Baba, Ali, Kabul. I thought of the life I had lived until the winter of 1975 came along and changed everything and made me what I am today. Chapter 2 When we were children, Hassan and I used to climb the poplar trees in the driveway of my father's house and annoy our neighbors by reflecting sunlight into their homes with a shard of mirror. We would sit across from each other on a pair of high branches, our naked feet dangling, our trouser pockets filled with dried mulberries and walnuts. We took turns with the mirror as we ate mulberries, pelted each other with them, giggling, laughing. I can still see Hassan up on the tree, sunlight flickering through the leaves on his almost perfectly round face a face like a Chinese doll, chiseled from hardwood, his flat, broad nose and slanting, narrow eyes like bamboo leaves, eyes that looked, depending on the lights, gold, green, even sapphire. I can still see his tiny, low-set ears and that pointed stub of a chin, a meaty appendage that looked like it was added as a mere afterthought, and that cleft lip just left of midline, where the Chinese doll maker's instrument may have slipped. Or perhaps he had simply grown tired and careless. Sometimes up in those trees, I talked Hassan into firing walnuts with his slingshot at the neighbor's one-eyed German shepherd. Hassan never wanted to, but if I asked, really asked, he wouldn't deny me. Hassan never denied me anything, and he was deadly with his slingshot. Hassan's father, Ali, used to catch us and get mad, or as mad as someone as gentle as Ali could ever get. He would wag his fingers and wave us down from the tree. He would take the mirror and tell us what his mother had told him, that the devil shone mirrors too, shown them to distract Muslims during prayer, and he laughs while he does it. He always added, scowling at his son. Yes, father, Hassan would mumble, looking down at his feet. But he never told me, never told that the mirror, like shooting walnuts at the neighbor's dog, was always my idea. The poplar trees lined the red brick driveway, which led to a pair of roof iron gates. They, in turn, opened into an extension of the driveway into my father's estate. The house sat on the left side of the brick path, the backyard at the end of it. Everyone agreed that my father, my baba, 
had built the most beautiful house in the Wazir Akbar Khan district, a new and affluent neighborhood in the northern part of Kabul. A broad entryway flanked by rose bushes led to the sprawling house of marble floors and wide windows. Intricate mosaic tiles, handpicked by Baba in Isfahan, covered the floors of the four bathrooms. Golden stitched tapestries which Baba had bought in Calcutta lined the walls. A crystal chandelier hung from the vaulted ceiling. Upstairs was my bedroom, Baba's room, and his study, also known as the smoking room, which perpetually smells of tobacco and cinnamon. Baba and his friends reclined on black leather chairs there after Ali had served dinner. They stuffed their pipes, except Baba always called it fattening the pipe, and discussed their favorite three topics, politics, business, soccer. Sometimes I asked Baba if I could sit with them, but Baba would stand in the doorway. Go on now, he'd say. This is grown-ups time. Why don't you go read one of those books of yours? He'd close the door, leave me to wonder why it was always grown-ups time with him. I'd sit by the door, knees drawn to my chest. Sometimes I sat there for an hour, sometimes two, listening to their laughter, their chatter. The living room downstairs had a curved wall with custom-built cabinets. Inside sat framed family pictures, an old grainy photo of my grandfather and King Nader Shah, taken in 1931, two years before the king's assassination. They are standing over a dead deer, dressed in knee-high boots, riffles slung over their shoulders. There was a picture of my parents' wedding night, Baba dashing in his black suit and my mother, a smiling young princess in white. Here was Baba and his best friend and business partner, Rahim Khan, standing outside our house, neither one smiling. I'm a baby in that photograph and Baba is holding me, looking tired and grim. I'm in his arms, but it's Rahim Khan's pinky my fingers are curled around. The curved wall led into the dining room, at the center of which was a mahogany table that would easily sit 30 guests. And given my father's taste for extravagant parties, it did just that almost every week. On the other end of the dining room was a tall marble fireplace always lit by orange glow of a fire in the winter time. A large sliding glass door opened into the semicircular terrace that overlooked two acres of backyard and rows of cherry trees. Baba and Ali had planted a small vegetable garden along the eastern wall. Tomatoes, mint, peppers, and the rows of corn that never really took. Hassan and I used to call it the wall of ailing corn. On the south end of the garden, in the shadow of a lakwat tree, was the servant's home, a modest little hut where Hassan lived with his father. It was there in that little shack that Hassan was born in the winter of 1964, just one year after my mother died giving birth to me. In the 18 years that I lived in that house, I stepped into Hassan and Ali's quarters only a handful of times. When the sun dropped down behind the hills and we were done playing for the day, Hassan and I parted ways. I went past the rose bushes to Baba's mansion, Hassan to the mud shack where he had been born, where he'd lived his entire life. I remember it was spare, clean, dimly lit by a pair of kerosene lamps. There were two mattresses on opposite sides of the room a worn Harati rug with frayed edges in between, a three-legged stool, and a wooden table in the corner where Hassan did his drawings. The walls stood bare, save for a single tapestry with soon in beads forming the words Allahu Akbar, which means, by the way, God is greater. Baba had bought it for Ali on one of his trips to Mashhad, which is a city in Iran. It was in that small shack that Hassan's mother, Sanubar, gave birth to him one cold winter day in 1964. While my mother hemorrhaged to death during childbirth, Hassan lost his less than a week after he was born. 
lost her to a fate most Afghans considered far worse than death. She ran off with a clan of traveling singers and dancers. Hassan never talked about his mother, as if she'd never existed. I always wondered if he dreamed about her, about what she looked like, where she was. I wondered if he longed to meet her. Did he ache for her, the way I ached for the mother I had never met? One day, we were walking from my father's house to Cinema Zainab for a new Iranian movie, taking the shortcuts through the military barracks near Istiklal Middle School. Baba had forbidden us to take that shortcut, but he was in Pakistan with Rahim Khan at the time. We hopped the fence that surrounded the barracks, skipped over a little creek, and broke into the open dirt field where old abandoned tanks collected dust. A group of soldiers huddled in the shade of one of those tanks, smoking cigarettes and playing cards. One of them saw us, elbowed the guy next to him and called Hassan. You, the Hazara! Look at me when I'm talking to you, the soldier barked. He handed the cigarette to the guy next to him, made a circle with the thumb and index finger on one hand, poked the middle finger of his other hand through the circle. Poked it in and out, in and out. I knew your mother. Did you know that? I knew her real good. I took her from behind by that creek over there. The soldiers laughed. One of them made a squealing sound. I told Hassan to keep walking, keep walking. What a tight little sugary cunt she had. The soldier was saying, shaking hands with the others, grinning. Later, in the dark, after the movie had started, I heard Hassan next to me croaking. Tears were sliding down his cheeks. I reached across my seat, slung my arm around him, pulled him close. He rested his head on my shoulder. He took you for someone else, I whispered. He took you for someone else. That must really hurt. I'm told no one was really surprised when Sanubar eloped. People had raised their eyebrows when Ali, a man who had memorized the Quran, married Sanubar, a woman 19 years younger, a beautiful but notoriously unscrupulous woman who lived up to her dishonorable reputation. Like Ali, she was a Shia Muslim and an ethnic Hazara. She was also his first cousin and therefore a natural choice for a spouse. But beyond those similarities, Ali and Sanubar had little in common, least of all their respective appearances. While Sanubar's brilliant green eyes and impish face had, rumor has it, tempted countless men into sin, Ali had a congenital paralysis of his lower facial muscles a condition that rendered him unable to smile and left him perpetually grim-faced. It was an odd thing to see the stone-faced Ali happy or sad, because only his slanted brown eyes glinted with a smile or welled with sorrow. People say that eyes are windows to the soul. Never was that more true than with Ali, who could only reveal himself through his eyes. I have heard that Sanubar's suggestive stride and oscillating hips sent men to reveries of infidelity. But polio had left Ali with a twisted, atrophied right leg that was solo skin over bone with little in between except a paper-thin layer of muscle. I remember one day, when I was eight, Ali was taking me to the bazaar to buy some nun. I was walking behind him humming, trying to imitate his walk. I watched him swing his scraggy leg in a sweeping arc, watched his whole body tilt impossibly to the right every time he planted that foot. It seemed a minor miracle he didn't tip over with each step. When I tried it, I almost fell into the gutter. That got me giggling. Ali turned around, caught me aping him. He didn't say anything, not then, not ever. He just kept walking. Ali's face and his walk frightened some of the younger children in the neighborhood. But the real trouble was with the older kids. They chased him on the street and mocked him when he hobbled by. Some had taken to calling him Babalu or Boogeyman. Hey Babalu, who did you eat today? They barked to a chorus of laughter. Who did you eat? 
You flat-nosed bubble. They called him flat-nosed because of Ali and Hassan's characteristic Hazara Mongolid features. For years, that was all I knew about the Hazaras, that they were Mongol descendants, and that they looked a little like Chinese people. School textbooks barely mentioned them and referred to their ancestry only in passing. Then one day, I was in Baba's study, looking through his stuff, when I found one of my mother's old history books. It was written by an Iranian named Khorrami. I blew the dust off it, sneaked it into my bed with me that night, and was stunned to find an entire chapter on Hazara history an entire chapter dedicated to Hassan's people. In it, I read that my people, the Pashtuns, had persecuted and oppressed the Hazaras. It said that Hazaras had tried to raise against Pashtuns in the 19th century, but the Pashtuns had quelled them with unspeakable violence. The book said that my people had killed the Hazaras, driven them from their lands, burned their homes, and sold their women. The book said part of the reason Pashtuns had oppressed the Hazaras was that Pashtuns were Sunni Muslims while Hazaras were Shia. The book said a lot of things I didn't know, things my teacher hadn't mentioned, things Baba hadn't mentioned either. It also said some things I did know, like that people called Hazaras mice-eating, flat-nosed, load-carrying donkeys. I had heard some of the kids in the neighborhood yell those names to Hassan. The following week, after class, I showed the book to my teacher and pointed to the chapter on the Hazaras. He skimmed through a couple of pages, snickered, handed the book back. That's the one thing Shia people do well, he said, picking up his papers, passing themselves as martyrs. He wrinkled his nose when he said the word Shia, like it was some kind of disease. But despite sharing ethnic heritage and family blood, Sanubar joined the neighborhood kids in taunting Ali. I have heard that she made no secret of her disdain for his appearance. This is a husband? She would sneer. I have seen old donkeys better suited to be a husband. In the end, most people suspected the marriage had been an arrangement of sorts between Ali and his uncle, Sanubar's father. They said Ali had married his cousin to help restore some honor to his uncle's blemished name, even though Ali, who had been orphaned at the age of five, had no worldly possessions or inheritance to speak of. Ali never retaliated against any of his tormentors, I suppose partly because he could never catch them with that twisted leg dragging behind him, but mostly because Ali was immune to the insult of his assailants. He had found his joy, his antidote, the moment Sanubar had given birth to Hassan. It had been a simple enough affair. No obstetricians, no anesthesiologists, no fancy monitoring devices. Just Sanubar laying in a stained naked mattress with Ali and the midwife helping her. She hadn't needed much help at all, because even in birth, Hassan was true to his nature. He was incapable of hurting anyone. A few grunts, a couple of pushes, and out came Hassan. Out he came, smiling. As confided to a neighbor's servant by the garrulous midwife, who had then in turn told anyone who would listen, Sanubar had taken one glance at the baby in Ali's arms, seen the cleft lip, and barked a bitter laughter. There, she had said. Now you have your own idiot child to do all your smiling for you. She had refused to even hold Hassan, and just five days later, she was gone. Baba hired the same nursing woman who had fed me to nurse Hassan. Ali told us she was a blue-eyed Hazara woman from Bamiyan, the city of giant Buddha statues. What a sweet singing voice she had, he used to say to us. What did she sing? Hassan and I always asked though we already knew. Ali had told us countless times. We just wanted to hear Ali singing. He'd clear his throat and begin. On a high mountain I stood and cried the name of Ali, Lion of God. Oh, Ali, Lion of God, King of men, bring joy to our sorrowful hearts. 
then he would remind us that there was a brotherhood between people who had fed from the same breast, a kinship that not even time could break. Hassan and I fed from the same breasts. We took our first steps on the same lawn in the same yard, and under the same roof we spoke our first words. Mine was Baba. This part made me emotional. Mine was Baba. His was Amir, my name. Looking back on it now, I think the foundation for what happened in the winter of 1975 and all that followed was already laid in those first words. Chapter 3 Lore has it, my father once wrestled a black bear in Baluchistan with his bare hands. If the story had been about anyone else, it would have been dismissed as love, the Afghan tendency to exaggerate. Sadly, almost a national affliction, if someone bragged that his son was a doctor, chances were the kid had passed a biology test in high school. But no one ever doubted the veracity of any story of Baba. And if they did, well, Baba did have those three parallel scars coursing a jagged path down his back. I have imagined Baba's wrestling match countless times, even dreamed about it. And in those dreams, I can never tell Baba from the bear. It was Rahim Khan who first referred to him as what eventually became Baba's famous nickname, Tufan Agha, or Mr. Hurricane. It was an apt enough nickname. My father was a force of nature, a towering Pashtun specimen with a thick beard a wayward crop of curly brown hair as unruly as man himself, hands that looked capable of uprooting a willow tree, and a black glare that would drop the devil to his knees begging for mercy, as Rahim Khan used to say. At parties, when all six foot five of him thundered into the room, attention shifted to him like sunflowers turning to the sun. Baba was impossible to ignore, even in his sleep. I used to bury cotton wipes in my ears, pull the blanket over my head, and still the sounds of Baba's snoring, so much like a growling truck engine, penetrated the walls. And my room was across the hall from Baba's bedroom. How my mother ever managed to sleep in that same room as him is a mystery to me. It's on the long list of things I would have asked my mother if I had ever met her. In the late 1960s, when I was five or six, Baba decided to build an orphanage. I heard the story through Rahim Khan. He told me Baba had drawn the blueprints himself, despite the fact that he'd had no architectural experience at all. Skeptics had urged him to stop the foolishness and hire an architect. Of course, Baba refused, and everyone shook their heads in dismay at his obstinate ways. Then, Baba succeeded, and everyone shook their heads in awe at his triumphant ways. Baba paid for the construction of the two-story orphanage just off the main strip of Jad de Maiwand, south of the Kabul River, with his own money. Rahim Khan told me Baba had personally funded the entire project, paying for the engineers, electricians, plumbers, and laborers, not to mention the city officials whose mustaches needed oiling, which means bribing. It took three years to build the orphanage. I was eight by then. I remember the day before the orphanage opened, Baba took me to Garga Lake, a few miles north of Kabul. He asked me to fetch Hassan too, but I lied and told him Hassan had the runs. I wanted Baba all to myself. And besides, one time at Karga Lake, Hassan and I were skimming stones and Hassan made his stone skip eight times. The most I managed was five. Baba was there, watching, and he patted Hassan on the back, even put his arm around his shoulder. We sat at a picnic table on the banks of the lake, just Baba and me, eating boiled eggs with kufta sandwiches, meatballs and pickles wrapped in naan. The water was a deep blue and sunlight glittered on its looking glass clear surface. On Fridays, the lake was bustling with families out for a day in the sun. But it was midweek and there was only Baba and me, us and a couple of long-haired bearded tourists, hippies I'd heard them called. 
They were sitting on the dock, feet dangling in the water, fishing poles in hand. I asked Baba why they grew their hair long, but Baba grunted, didn't answer. He was preparing his speech for the next day, flipping through a havoc of handwritten pages, making notes here and there with a pencil. I bit into my egg and asked Baba if it was true what a boy in school had told me that if you ate a piece of eggshell, you'd have to pee it out. Baba grunted again. I took a bite of my sandwich. One of the yellow-haired tourists laughed and slapped the other one on the back. In the distance, across the lake, a truck lumbered around the corner on the hill. Sunlight twinkled in its side view mirror. I think I have saraton, I said. Cancer. Baba lifted his head from the pages, flapping in the breeze. Told me I could get the soda myself. All I had to do was look in the trunk of the car. Outside the orphanage the next day, they ran out of chairs. A lot of people had to stand to watch the opening ceremony. It was a windy day, and I sat behind Baba on the little podium just outside the main entrance of the new building. Baba was wearing a green suit and a caracal hat. Midway through the speech, the wind knocked his hat off and everyone laughed. He mentioned to me to hold his hat for him, and I was glad to because then everyone would see that he was my father, my Baba. He turned back to the microphone and said he hoped the building was sturdier than his hat, and everyone laughed again. When Baba ended his speech, people stood up and cheered. They clapped for a long time. Afterward, people shook his hand. Some of them tousled my hair and shook my hand too. I was so proud of Baba, of us. But despite Baba's success, people were always doubting him. They told Baba that running a business wasn't in his blood and he should study law like his father. So Baba proved them all wrong by not only running his own business, but becoming one of the richest merchants in Kabul. Baba and Rahim Khan built a wildly successful carpet exporting business, two pharmacies and a restaurant. When people scoffed that Baba would never marry well, after all, he was not of a royal blood. He wedded my mother, Sofia Akrami, a highly educated woman universally regarded as one of Kabul's most respected, beautiful, and virtuous ladies. And not only did she teach Farsi literature at the university, she was a descendant of the royal family. A fact that my father playfully rubbed in the skeptics' faces by referring to her as my princess. With me as the glaring exception, my father molded the world around him to his liking. The problem, of course, was that Baba saw the world in black and white. And he got to decide what was black and what was white. You can't love a person who lives that way without fearing him too. Maybe even hating him a little. When I was in fifth grade, we had a mullah who taught us about Islam. His name was Mullah Fatiullah Khan. A short, stubby man with a face full of acne scars and a gruff voice. He lectured us about virtues of zakat and the duty of hajj. He taught us the intricacies of performing the five daily namaz prayers and made us memorize verses from the Quran. And though he never translated the words for us, he did stress, sometimes with the help of a stripped willow branch, that we had to pronounce Arabic words correctly so God would hear us better. He told us one day that Islam considered drinking a terrible sin. Those who drank would answer for their sin in the day of Qiyamat, Judgment Day. In those days, drinking was fairly common in Kabul. No one gave you a public lashing for it, but those Afghans who did drink did so in private, out of respect. People bought their scotch as medicine in brown paper bags from selected pharmacies. They would leave with the bag tucked out of sight, sometimes drawing furtive disapproving glances from those who knew about the store's reputation for such transactions. We were upstairs in Baba's study, the smoking room, when I told him what Mullah Fatiullah Khan had taught us in class. Baba was pouring himself a whiskey from the bar he had built in the corner of the room. He listened, nodded, took a sip from his drink. Then he lowered himself into the leather sofa, put down his drink, and propped me up on his lap. I felt as if I were sitting on a pair of tree trunks. 
He took a deep breath and exhaled through his nose, the air hissing through his mustache for what seemed an eternity. I couldn't decide whether I wanted to hug him or leap from his lap in mortal fear. I see you've confused what you're learning in school with actual education, he said in his thick voice. But if what he said is true, then does it make you a sinner, Baba? Hmm. Baba crushed an ice cube between his teeth. Do you want to know what your father thinks about sin? Yes. Then I'll tell you, Baba said. But first, understand this and understand it now, Amir. You'll never learn anything of value from those bearded idiots. You mean Mullah Fatiullah Khan? Baba gestured with his glass. The ice clinked. I mean all of them. Piss on the beards of all those self-righteous monkeys. I began to giggle. The image of Baba pissing on the beard of any monkey, self-righteous or otherwise, was too much. They do nothing but thumb their prayer beads and recite a book written in a tongue they don't even understand. He took a sip. God help us all if Afghanistan ever falls into their hands. But Mullah Fatiullah Khan seems nice. I managed between bursts of tittering. So did Genghis Khan, Baba said. But enough about that. You asked about sin and I want to tell you. Are you listening? Yes, I said, pressing my lips together. But the chortle escaped through my nose and made a snorting sound. That got me giggling again. Baba's stony eyes bore into mine and just like that, I wasn't laughing anymore. I mean to speak to you man to man. Do you think you can handle that for once? Yes, Baba John, I muttered, marveling, not for the first time, at how badly Baba could sting me with its so few words. We had a fleeting good moment. It wasn't often Baba talked to me, let alone on his lap, and I'd been a fool to waste it. Good, Baba said, but his eyes wondered. Now, no matter what the mullah teaches, there is only one sin, only one, and that is theft. Every other sin is a variation of theft. Do you understand that? No, Baba John, I said, desperately wishing I did. I didn't want to disappoint him again. Baba heaved a sigh of impatience. That stung too, because he was not an impatient man. I remember all the times he didn't come home until after dark, all the times I ate dinner alone. I'd ask Ali where Baba was when he was coming home, though I knew full well that he was at the construction site, overlooking this, supervising that. Didn't that take patience? I already hated all the kids he was building the orphanage for. Sometimes I wish they'd all die along with their parents. When you kill a man, you steal a life, Baba said. You steal his wife's right to a husband, rob his children of a father. When you tell a lie, you steal someone's right to the truth. When you cheat, you steal the right of fairness. Do you see? I did. When Baba was six, a thief walked into my grandfather's house in the middle of the night. My grandfather, a respected judge, confronted him, but the thief stabbed him in the throat, killing him instantly and robbing Baba of a father. The townspeople caught the killer just before noon the next day. He turned out to be a wanderer from Kandus region. They hanged him from the branch of an oak tree with a still two hours to go before afternoon prayer. It was Rahim Khan, not Baba, who had told me this story. I was always learning things about Baba from other people. There is no act more wretched than a stealing Amir, Baba said. A man who takes what's not his to take, be it a life or a loaf of none, I spit on such a man. And if I ever cross paths with him, God help him. Do you understand? I found the idea of Baba clobbering a thief both exhilarating and terribly frightening. Yes, Baba. If there is a God out there, then I would hope he has more important things to attend than to my drinking scotch or eating pork. Now, hop down. All this talk about sin has made me thirsty again. I watched him fill his glass at the bar and wondered how much time would pass 
before we talked again the way we just had. Because the truth of it was, I always felt like Baba hated me a little. And why not? After all, I had killed his beloved wife, his beautiful princess, hadn't I? The least I could have done was to have had the decency to have turned out a little more like him. But I hadn't turned out like him. Not at all. In school, we used to play a game called Sher Jangi, or Battle of the Poems. The Farsi teacher moderated it and it went something like this. You recite a verse from a poem and your opponent had 60 seconds to reply with a verse that began with the same letter that ended yours. Everyone in my class wanted me on their team because by the time I was 11, I could recite dozens of verses from Khayyam, Hafez, or Romi's famous Masnavi. One time, I took on the whole class and won. I told Baba about it later that night, but he just nodded, muttered, good. That was how I escaped my father's aloofness in my dead mother's books. That and Hassan, of course. I read everything, Romi, Hafez, Saadi, Victor Hugo, Jules Verne, Mark Twain, Ian Fleming. When I had finished my mother's books, not the boring history ones, I was never much into those, but the novels, the epics, I started spending my allowance on books. I bought one a week from the bookstore near Cinema Park and stored them in a cardboard boxes when I ran out of shelf room. Of course, marrying a poet was one thing, but fathering a son who preferred burying his face in poetry books to hunting? Well, that wasn't how Baba had envisioned it, I suppose. Real men didn't read poetry, and God forbid they should ever write it. Real men, real boys, played soccer, just as Baba had when he had been young. Now that was something to be passionate about. In 1970, Baba took a break from the construction of the orphanage and flew to Tehran for a month to watch the World Cup games on television, since at the time Afghanistan didn't have TVs yet. He signed me up for soccer teams to stir the same passion in me. But I was pathetic, a blundering liability to my own team, always in the lane. I shambled about the field on the scraggy legs, squalled for passes that never came my way. And the harder I tried, waving my arms over my head, frantically and screeching, I'm open, I'm open, the more I went ignored. But Baba wouldn't give up. When it became abundantly clear that I hadn't inherited a shred of his athletic talents, he settled for trying to turn me into a passionate spectator. Certainly, I could manage that, couldn't I? I faked interest for as long as possible. I cheered with him when Kabul's team scored against Kandahar and yelped insults at the referee when he called a penalty against our team. But Baba sensed my lack of genuine interest and resigned himself to the bleak fact that his son was never going to either play or watch soccer. I remember one time Baba took me to the yearly Buzkashi tournament that took place on the first day of spring, New Year's Day. Buzkashi was, and still is, Afghanistan's national passion. A chapandaz, a highly skilled horseman, usually patronized by rich aficionados, had to snatch a goat or cattle carcass from the midst of Malay, carry that carcass with him around the stadium of full gallop, and drop it in a scoring circle, while a team of other chapandaz chases him and does everything in its power, kick, claw, whip, punch, to snatch that carcass from him. That day, the crowd roared with excitement as the horsemen on the field bellowed their battle cries and jostled for the carcass in a cloud of dust. The earth trembled with clatter of hooves. We watched from the upper bleachers as riders pounded past us at full gallop, yipping and yelling foam flying from their horse's mouth. At one point, Baba pointed to someone. Amir, do you see that man sitting up there with those other men around him? I did. That's Henry Kissinger. Oh, I said. I didn't know who Henry Kissinger was, and I might have asked. But at that moment, I watched with horror as one of the chapandas fell off his saddle and was trampled under a score of hooves. His body was tossed and hurled in the stampede like a ragdoll. 
finally rolling to a stop when the Malay moved on. He twitched once and lay motionless. His legs bent at unnatural angles. A pool of his blood soaking through the sand. I began to cry. I cried all the way back home. I remember how Baba's hands clenched around the steering wheel, clenched and unclenched. Mostly, I will never forget Baba's valiant efforts to conceal the disgusted look on his face as he drove in silence. Later that night, I was passing by my father's study when I overheard him speaking to Rahim Khan. I pressed my ears to the closed door. Be grateful that he's healthy, Rahim Khan was saying. I know, I know. But he's always buried in those books or shuffling around the house like he's lost in some dream. And? I wasn't like that. Baba sounded frustrated, almost angry. Rahim Khan laughed. Children aren't coloring books. You don't get to fill them with your favorite colors. I'm telling you, Baba said. I wasn't like that at all. And neither were any of the kids I grew up with. You know... Sometimes you are the most self-centered man I know, Rahim Khan said. He was the only person I knew who could get away with saying something like that to Baba. It has nothing to do with that. Nay? Nay. Then what? I heard the leather of Baba's seat creaking as he shifted on it. I closed my eyes, pressed my ear even harder against the door, wanting to hear, not wanting to hear. Sometimes I look out this window and I see him playing on the street with the neighborhood boys. I see how they push him around, take his toys from him, give him a shove here, a whack there. And, you know, he never fights back. Never. He just drops his head and... So he's not violent, Rahim Khan said. That's not what I mean, Rahim, and you know it. Baba shout back. There is something missing in that boy. Yes, a mean streak. Self-defense has nothing to do with meanness. You know what always happens when the neighborhood boys tease him? Hassan steps in and fends them off. I've seen it with my own eyes. And when they come home, I say to him, how did Hassan get that scrape on his face? And he says, he fell down. I'm telling you, Rahim, there is something missing in that boy. You just need to let him find his ways, Rahim Khan said. And where is he headed? Baba said. A boy who won't stand up for himself becomes a man who can't stand up to anything. As usual, you're oversimplifying. I don't think so. You're angry because you're afraid he'll never take over the business for you. Now, who's oversimplifying? Baba said. Look. I know there's a fondness between you and him, and I'm happy about that. Envious, but happy. I mean that. He needs someone who understands him, because God knows I don't. But something about Amir troubles me in a way that I can't express it. It's like I could see him searching, reaching for the right words. He lowered his voice, but I heard him anyway. If I hadn't seen the doctor pull him out of my wife with my own eyes, I'd never believe he's my son. The next morning, as he was preparing my breakfast, Hassan asked if something was bothering me. I snapped at him, told him to mind his own business. Rahim Khan had been wrong about the mean streak thing. I'm going to save the rest of the story for another time. Hope you join me.